Well, I'd like to welcome everyone tonight to our Vesper service here at Blessings Christian Church. And we promote this service as a teaching service. It has a slightly different character than our morning service. And what distinguishes this service in part is the opportunity for you to text questions after the sermon. I was just watching uh, Fox News. Uh, Robert George, who is a professor of jurisprudence at Princeton University, I'm a big fan of his, he was being interviewed, and he was distinguishing indoctrination from education. Uh, on the surface, they seem the same. The difference is this. If you're educating, you always give people opportunity to question. If you're indoctrinating, you impart information and you say, no questions asked. It's very important in the church to create a culture where people feel free to ask questions. And uh, so you're, you're free to ask questions really about anything. And in some cases, you might be right and I might be wrong. Um, and we have the scriptures, of course, to bow before. Um, so a well, warm welcome to all of you who are here tonight and, of course, to those who are joining us online. My name is Bill DeYoung. I'm one of the pastors here at Blessings. And uh, if you would like information about Blessings Christian Church, please direct an email to info at blessingshamilton.ca. We receive all kinds of questions and we answer all kinds of questions. If there's anything that piques your curiosity about Jesus or about the church, we'd be very happy to hear from you. Then if you have a matter on your heart that you want to pray about or you want to have someone pray about, you can direct an email to prayer-team at blessingshamilton.ca and we'll be happy to pray about whatever it is that you're asking about. And then at the conclusion of this service, we will have representatives from our prayer team by the purple banner to my left, and they will also be very uh, interested. Those representatives from our prayer team, I should say, will be very willing to pray with you and for you. I do remind you that uh, we're still in the middle of the pandemic. I made some predictions that we're not going to go back to lockdown. I'm abiding by those predictions, but we do want to adhere to the protocols. This means that uh, you ought to keep your masks on uh, during the service, and uh, at the conclusion of the service, please remain seated, and the ushers will approach your pew one by one to dismiss you wedding ceremony style. I should remind you also that we have the service of broadcast downstairs in the fellowship hall and uh, if you get stressed with uh, anxiety or if you have a child who's acting out um, you can go to the fellowship hall downstairs and you can watch the service there well we're going to be talking tonight about work and about what's called the cultural mandate it's something we read about in genesis where God says, uh, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the creatures. And there's an allusion to that mandate in Psalm 8. And so I'm going to read Psalm 8 tonight as our call to worship. Listen to these words. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. We're going to sing as our opening number, We Will Feast and We'll Stand as We Sing. If you're able, at least, we will stand to sing, We Will Feast.
lift up our hearts. Well, we have the practice here at Blessings in our Vesper service of reciting the ancient creeds of Christendom, in particular the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. And the Apostles' Creed begins in Latin with the word credo. And originally it had the idea of giving your heart. And so When we recite the creed, it's not simply a matter of us affirming certain beliefs, but of expressing our trust, of pledging our allegiance, of saying how we are giving our heart to the triune God. Let's be mindful of that tonight as we recite these words. Congregation, in whom do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried, he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Let's come before the Lord in prayer together. This is such a beautiful evening for us, Father, to meet in this place at this time. It's a wonderful time of the year, a wonderful time of the day. We thank you for the beauty of this day and for the beauty of this evening. For the wonderful blue sky we could enjoy, for the remarkably mild temperatures we've had throughout this month, and especially now for this opportunity to meet together before your throne in worship to hear your voice. And we are sitting in these pews as people with very diverse stories to tell, very diverse questions on our mind, very diverse burdens on our hearts. But we thank you that we can be in this place where you orient us in a special way by speaking to us through the preaching of the gospel. We thank you that we can be here to enjoy fellowship, that we're no longer limited at least to being at home. Some of us have the opportunity to worship in person, and we're grateful, Father, for that, because we understand how meaningful and how significant it is for us to be here in our bodies, to see one another's faces, even though they're partly covered by masks, to sing together. We pray for those of us who are joining us from their homes, and we pray that even though they're not able to enjoy worship as we can tonight, that still this would be a meaningful experience for them. And we pray that by means of this worship service, you would teach us more about Jesus, that you would bring us still closer to him, Help us to understand more of his identity and more of his work. And help us to understand more about ourselves as well, as those who are in need of a Savior, as those who are in need of this one who died on the cross and rose three days later. We pray that you would be busy in this place at this time by means of your Spirit, working in our hearts, and ultimately transforming our lives so that we look a little more like Jesus. We pray that your favor would rest upon us tonight and that every element of our worship would bring you honor and praise. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in our evening services, we've been going through the Ten Commandments and we've reached the Eighth Commandment tonight. And we have as one of our doctrinal standards the Heidelberg Catechism. It dates back to the 16th century. It's a document that explains the fundamentals of the Christian faith, and among those fundamentals are the Ten Commandments, the basis for Christian conduct and for Christian ethics. And as I said, we'll be considering the Eighth Commandment, which is explained for us in Lord's Day 42. I'm going to read the first question and answer myself, and then invite you to respond to the second question. What does God forbid in the Eighth Commandment? God forbids not only outright theft and robbery, but also such wicked schemes and devices as false weights and measures, deceptive merchandising, counterfeit money and usury. We must not defraud our neighbor in any way, whether by force or by show of right, in addition, God forbids all greed and all abuse or squandering of his gifts. If you could respond to the second question, what does God require of you in this commandment? I must promote my neighbor's good wherever I can and may, deal with him as I would like others to deal with me, and work faithfully so that I may be able to give to those and then our scripture text is quite short. It comes from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 4, and we're going to read simply verse 28. Ephesians 4, verse 28.
Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. This is the word of the Lord. Well, a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to hear John Maxwell speak. I don't know if you know the name John Maxwell. He is a Christian leadership guru, writes a lot of books about Christian leadership, talks a lot about Christian leadership. And in the course of this particular talk, he indicated that he has a lot of people come up to him and say to him, John, I don't know what I should do. I don't like my job. And Maxwell always responds in the same way to that question. He says, well, then quit. To which people say, well, I can't. And then you get a variety of reasons, because I need the money, I have to provide for my family, or I won't be able to locate another job. To which Maxwell says, well, then you better start enjoying your job. Well, is it possible to enjoy your work? John Maxwell is someone who enjoys his work. For decades, he's been writing and speaking, as I said, about leadership. He's now, I believe, in his 70s, and he indicated in the same talk that he sometimes has people approach him and say, John, why don't you retire? To which he says, well, why would I retire? To which people say, so you can do what you want. To which he says, well, I guess I am retired then, because I'm doing what I want. Now, to be honest, I think that John Maxwell can at times be a little simplistic and a little facile because there are all kinds of reasons why we might not like our jobs. It could be our co-workers, our employer, our employees. It could be our working conditions. It could be our pay. It could be the toll that our particular work takes on our bodies. And many of us find ourselves in a place where we're frustrated. Then, moreover, there are others who don't find fulfillment in their work. And I have this uh, often as a pastor where people approach me and they say, I'm not really enjoying my work. I don't find fulfillment in it. I think I would rather be engaged in full-time Christian ministry. Uh, I think this is the, the line of work that God would be pleased with. And I have to say to you, that can often be a temptation for people to abandon work for which they are particularly skilled in order to do full-time Christian ministry, which they assume is something that would please God more. So I want to talk to you tonight about work. Now, you may look at me and say, well, you're not exactly the guy who probably should be talking about working, right? Right? Uh, When my boys were younger, there was an occasion where I said to them, do any of you want to be a pastor when you grow up? And one of my boys chimed in. He says, no, I want to work. So, and that might be exactly the perception that you have of what I do as a pastor. It reminds me of this saying you used to hear about pastors, six days invisible, one day incomprehensible. Well, I'm going to do my best, and like I said, you only need to listen to me if I'm speaking to you from Scripture. If I'm speaking to you from Scripture, which is God's Word, well, then we need to pay very close attention. But I want to underscore that work is something good. And over the course of uh, our time together tonight, I want to identify two things in particular. First of all, the calling of work, and then secondly, the purpose of work. The calling of work and then the purpose of work. We're dealing tonight with the Eighth Commandment, which says, do not steal. And the Heidelberg Catechism gives a very good explanation of this. It says this means that we should not defraud our neighbor in any way, but we should also promote our neighbor's good, and we promote our neighbor's good in part by working. It's exactly what the Apostle Paul teaches in Ephesians 4 20, 28. Anyone who is stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his hands in order that he might share something with those who are in need. 
So, I'm going to argue tonight that work is something good, and to do so, we're going to walk very quickly through the story of Scripture to see how this unfolds. And we want to begin with creation, and then we're going to move to the fall, and then to Jesus, and then to the new creation. So, in the creation story, we learn that we were created to work. We were created in the image of God who is a worker. In the image of God, who is a creator and a builder, and God said to Adam and Eve, before there was even a hint of sin in the world, you need to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over all the creatures of the earth. This is called the cultural mandate, Genesis 1, 26, 27, and 28. And it's so important for us to see that this was a calling humanity had prior to to the fall into sin. I think we sometimes imagine that life in the Garden of Eden was like a vacation in the Bahamas. Adam and Eve may be lying on a beach somewhere with a tequila in their hands or something like that. We need to see that prior to the fall into sin, God said to Adam and Eve, you need to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the creatures, tend and keep the garden. Well, then what happened? Then what happened is the fall, the fall into sin. Incidentally, the fall into sin is a violation of the Eighth Commandment. It is stealing in some sort where Adam and Eve try to take something that doesn't belong to them, which is why some theologians call it cosmic robbery. They took of the forbidden fruit, which didn't belong to them because they wanted to have knowledge like God's. What was the implication of the sin. Well, there was curses that were pronounced on the serpent, on earth, on humanity. Adam and Eve, you have to note, were still called to work, but now their work would be complicated and frustrated. They were still called to produce, but now there would be pain in production. So Adam and Eve, Adam would have to work by the sweat of his brow among thorns and thistles, and Eve would have pain in childbirth. Still a calling to work, still a calling to produce, but now um, frustrated by pain. Well, then we get to Jesus. What does Jesus do? Does Jesus rescue us from work? Well, he doesn't rescue us from work. Well, does he call us to abandon our ordinary mundane vocations to be itinerant preachers. Isn't that what he did with the disciples? Leave your fishing nets behind, come and follow me and be itinerant preachers. Well, he said that to some, but certainly not to all. In fact, when we study Jesus in the Gospels, we find him at almost every turn affirming work and affirming all kinds of work. But what kind of work did Jesus affirm? Well, Jesus wore clothing. He likely wore a shawl of wool for which he said, thank you, farmers. Thank you, tailors. Jesus wore sandals for which he said, thank you, tanners. Jesus wore belts around his shawl. Thank you, girdlers. I just learned the word girdler, by the way. I googled someone who makes belts. And it said, girdler. Jesus endorsed research and development in science and technology and all kinds of industry. We see this when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. And he prescribed as elements for the Lord's Supper bread and wine. Well, if you want to make bread, you've got to know the science of grain and the science of yeasting. And you need implements to grind flour. If you want to make wine, you need to know the science of grapes and of fermentation, and you need implements to press the grapes. Jesus, you see, in instituting the Lord's Supper, was endorsing farming and winemaking, endorsing bakeries and wineries. And where were you going to put the bread? Well, you had to put it on the table. Jesus was endorsing carpentry and table makers. How are you going to drink the wine in a cup? Jesus was endorsing cup makers. 
Jesus was basically endorsing Ikea. Actually, you know, I think the, the one store that Jesus would almost certainly endorse is Canadian Tire. You know, I, I've lived in three different countries, three different places in the U.S., two different places in the Netherlands. There is no store like Canadian Tire. On every aisle, you're like, I could use that. I'm getting distracted. <clears throat> Jesus did not come to rescue us from work, but he did come to rescue us from the curse on work. And I want to ask you, what was Jesus wearing on his head when he was crucified? A crown made of thorns. God cursed the ground to frustrate human labor by causing thorns and thistles to arise. And Jesus endured the curse on labor by suffering a crown of thorns pressed into his scalp. And that's a sign to us that he's going to ensure a future where we will work, but without the curse. And this is exactly what we're going to find in the holy city. Uh, Pastor Hilmer referenced this this morning. In Revelation 20, 20, uh, 21, we see this holy city descend out of heaven. What is that city going to be like? Well, we get a glimpse of it in Isaiah 60, and what we discover is that it's a city not unlike our cities. The holy city that we anticipate in the new creation will be a city of commerce. It will be a city of commercial activity. You can read through Isaiah 60, there are ships of Tarshish carrying gold and silver that dock in the harbor. There are caravans of camels on trade routes. There is lumber being imported from Lebanon. The wealth of the nations are brought to the city. And in just about every description of it, we see a city full of commerce, a city full of economic activity, a city full of labor, but now without any curse, without any pain or frustration. So, God created humanity to work, and work because of the fall was frustrated, but Jesus endorsed work, and we can anticipate work in the new creation. Well, what then are the purposes of work? I just happened to read something by Charles Spurgeon, and he makes the argument that work is a shield from temptation. It's the idea, you know, idle hands are the devil's workshop. And I think that is a biblical idea. I don't think the arguments that Spurgeon used for this were very sound. Because he pointed out, he argued that God meets people when they're working. And he gave all kinds of examples of this. God meets Moses when he's tending sheep. God meets Elisha when he's uh, plowing the field. God meets Gideon when he's grinding corn. God meets the disciples when they're fishing. This is a sign, he says, that we're supposed to be working because that's where God meets us. But then I thought to myself, aren't there also many places when God meets people when they're sleeping? So I'm not sure that's the best argument to use. I just want to identify for you tonight two main purposes for work, the first of which is production, and the second of which is provision. So first of all, God created us to produce useful, necessary, and beautiful things. God created us to produce useful, necessary, and beautiful things. I already referred to the cultural mandate, right? Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over all the creatures. The idea here is that you are to discover within creation the possibilities and the potencies lying dormant and inherent in creation and develop them into realities. To take untamed nature and transform it into a beautiful social environment. That's what Adam and Eve 
were to do. And it's exactly what has been done with Florida. Now, who here likes Florida? I am a child of immigrants, and for the life of me, I don't know why they didn't go to Florida. This is the time of the year, right, when we all like to go to Florida. But do you know that most of those beautiful places we like to frequent in Florida, if we've ever made it there, were once swampland, full of alligators, but it was transformed into this beautiful environment where people like to live and where people like to vacation. It was a fulfillment of sorts of the cultural mandate. Well, you say, but isn't that a license for exploitation? And it's true that humans have exploited creation all over, and we are guilty of it here in Canada. Uh, In the past, there was a very unthoughtful clear-cutting of forests without plans to reforest, uh, a very uncaring displacement of native animals and, and native plants. So we have to recognize that we can fulfill this mandate in a bad way, but we need to remember that we're created in the image of God. God is someone who builds and who fashions and who creates so that people and animals can flourish. God does not exploit. He does not dominate. We are created in his image, which means we are to image his character, which means we are not to dominate and we are not to exploit. It's very tricky how we do that well, and you may want to ask questions about that. But there is no license, biblically speaking, for exploiting the world in a sinful way. What exactly did Adam and Eve do in the, in the garden? Well, you know, I imagine day one, Adam's on his knees and he's trying to clear a space for him to sleep and he's trying to move stuff out of the way with his hands and then Eve reaches for a, a branch and she, she pulls it off the tree and she says, here, Adam, try this. And Adam begins to sweep away uh, stuff so he can find a place to sleep and he says, man, this is amazing. Let's call it rake. And they produced technology. We were created to produce necessary, useful, and beautiful things. Anyone who has been stealing should steal no longer, but work doing something useful with his hands. Well, a second purpose, and by the way, there are are many purposes. A second purpose of work would be provision. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his hands in order that he might share with those in need. The same point is made in the Heidelberg Catechism, and that's because there's a principle that's taught in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and it is this, there shall be no needy among you. Deuteronomy 16, Deuteronomy 15, Acts 4, Old Testament, New Testament, there shall be no needy among you. And that means we work in part to provide for those who cannot work so that everyone is provided for. You know, there's a really fascinating story that's narrated in 1 Samuel 30. David and his army are going to fight the Amalekites Uh, They've been busy all day. They cross a river, and half the men are too tired to proceed any further. And so David says, I want to rest here by the river. I and the other men will go and fight the Amalekites. They go and fight the Amalekites. They win. They bring back the spoil. And the men who had fought with David say, let's not share the spoil with those who did not fight. And David says, no, we're going to share the spoil evenly among those who could fight and among those who couldn't because it's the Lord's spoil. And so when we work hard and we earn an income and we amass wealth, it's not simply for us to enjoy. It's the Lord's wealth which we share with those who cannot work. Jesus came, and I'll conclude with this, Not to rescue us from work, but to rescue us from the bondage of work. 
And that means that we work freely. So many people in our society are working in order to obtain something, working simply to obtain rest. TGIF, Freedom 55, work in order to grab something. And the principle that we're taught in Scripture is Jesus gives us the rest we desperately need. He secures the, all, the future we desperately want. And cognizant of that grace and beginning to enjoy that rest, we go about our work. It's why it's Sunday first and then Monday through Friday because we're working in a gospel perspective with the grace and the rest that Jesus has already accomplished for us at the cross. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we realize tonight that we're not yet in the new creation. We are still on this side of glory and therefore work can still be so frustrating. Please enable us to see tonight that Jesus has secured rest for us so that we don't need to worry about what we shall eat or what we shall wear because you care for us even more than you care for the birds of the air and the lilies of the field. Help us to see that you are the provider and you are, you've created a pathway to a beautiful holy city, a new Jerusalem, where there will be all manner of work and labor, but void of the curse, and void of frustration. Enable us by means of your grace and your spirit to enjoy the work you have assigned us as much as we can. And forgive us for our many sins. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.